In 2018, DC launched Black Label, an imprint specifically created for darker, more adult superhero material. Although in 2020, when Vertigo was officially shuttered, Black Label took over reprinting evergreen Vertigo titles, like Sandman, Preacher, and Fables. Of the 40-plus titles Black Label has published to date, only two are original concepts. The rest are miniseries based on existing DC superhero properties. Black Label also publishes adult pop-up imprints, such as Hill Comics and the Murphyverse, which are Batman-centric titles primarily created by Sean Murphy. It also publishes the Sandman Universe line of titles. Basically, this imprint is designed to publish superhero stories that may or may not be considered canon. Whether they are depends on the impact of the story and the whims of editorial. For the most part, they are a cross between Elseworlds with a hint of Vertigo, usually starring popular properties. Black Label launched with some controversy. The first title, Batman Damned, became infamous for showing bat junk in the first issue, at least in the first print run. Reprints and digital editions have the Batarang encased in shadow. Officially, the appearance was explained as a production error. The colors had to be brightened during the printing process, and once brightened, that revealed Batman's privates. Which is a pretty ridiculous way to spin this incident, especially to anyone familiar with the printing process, or has any sense of logic. For whatever reason, this full frontal exposure caused a stir online, on talk shows, and at DC. It resulted in the second issue being delayed to have the artwork changed, presumably to remove any nudity. I'd guess the scene with Harley Quinn had some last-minute changes. The third issue was also rescheduled five times to accommodate changes. Anyway, this weird outrage led to a lot of editorial changes and it set the tone for Black Label in general. In fact, one series, a religious satire called Second Coming, was pulled by the creators due to the extensive changes that needed to be made. The other history of the DC Universe, which would have been published alongside Batman Damned, had its orders cancelled. It would be published two years later with significant changes, although it was not announced what caused the delay. Presumably, it was for language and nudity. So despite its mature subject matter, Black Label self-censored itself almost immediately. Nudity seems to be completely discouraged, and depending on the series, adult language is either censored or uncensored. It's an odd choice that is somewhat inconsistent. It seems the deciding factor is whether it's character appropriate or not. That is, would the character drop an F-bomb in the mainstream universe, or is the language being used because of the adult label on the comic? To date, Black Label has released a fair amount of material, a lot of which is Batman related. So let's take a look at these titles, in release order, and see what's good, what's bad, and what's ugly. Please note, this video just looks at the main Black Label lineup. Hill Comics and the Murphyverse will be the subject of separate videos. Now before we get to the reviews, let me shamelessly plug this channel. If you like this video, then give it a thumbs up and watch until the end. If you're new, please subscribe to be notified of future releases. As a struggling six-year-old channel, any and all support is greatly appreciated. As always, thank you for watching. Let's get back to the video. The series itself is a supernatural horror story involving the Batman. It begins with the death of the Joker. An injured Batman cannot recall what happened during their fight, or whether he's responsible for that death. During flashbacks, it's revealed that Bruce Wayne's parents had a less than happy marriage. And during the incident that led to their deaths, Bruce was also killed. But he sold his soul to the Enchantress, who returned him to life and he went on to become the Batman. There are a few more plot twists, and the ending is a huge surprise, so let's leave it as a brief summary. First of all, the artwork by Lee Bermeo is just outstanding. Especially Gotham itself, it really looks like a dirty gothic landscape overrun by crime. All the supporting characters, such as Constantine, Deadman, and Etrigan, have a reasonably unique design. But they aren't so unique that they aren't easily identifiable. Quite simply, the book looks perfect. The story is pretty tight, too. The writer, Brian Azzarello, writes something that is reasonably straightforward, although the end gets a touch oblique and it is abrupt. In the first issue, his recurring motif of quirky wordplay does stand out and it's hard not to notice. But this motif thankfully disappears over the next few issues. Overall, it's pretty solid and it stands up on a reread. The only slight criticism is the lettering. 
The narrator, John Constantine, has a running dialogue throughout the series that's done in a cursive font. However, it's placed on the artwork without a caption box, which was not ideal. It tended to blend in and be somewhat difficult to read at times. This is kind of minor, but it slightly annoyed me. In three issues, we get a very apocalyptic story about a freshly awakened Batman who needs to remove the controlling overlord, Omega. Batman encounters many different dangers as he attempts to discover how the world ended and how to fix the problem. The beginning is slightly awkward as the premise is being established. It begins with a simulation and then hard cuts to Bruce Wayne being told he's delusional. All the staff that were attending him were characters in that delusion. Naturally, as a reader, one has to think Bruce is being lied to, and now he's in a simulation and his mind is being messed with. Then, when he's released, he discovers the talking, disembodied head of the Joker in a jar. This surreal development further strengthens the reader's belief that a simulation is ongoing. At least, that's what it seemed like to me. However, the story is being straightforward in that respect. So don't overthink the premise, like your humble narrator. Overall, it's not a bad possible future for the Batman. The writer, Scott Snyder, does write a very good Clown Prince version of the Joker. His running dialogue and narration is quite good and character appropriate, considering the circumstances. It's a thrill ride of bad situations that seem quite hopeless, but it ends on a very hopeful note. Critically speaking, the reader will arrive at the true identity of Omega long before the story reveals it, but it still works. It's a solid adventure story that takes place in an alternate future. Greg Capullo's artwork has never been better. In fact, it was so good and evolved, I didn't even recognize his style at first. I highly suggest he keep the inker, Jonathan Glapion, on retainer, like Jim Lee does with Scott Williams. The two work very well together. This is Frank Miller's modernized take on Superman's origin and early days. Yep, it sure is. The story is about Harleen Quinzel and the Joker meeting and how it develops into a romance, which is what this series is, a romance comic. If you enjoy Stepan Sedgwick's writing and artwork, then you'll probably like this miniseries. His manga-influenced style is in full bloom, and it's a little more coherent than his most well-known series, Sunstone. Like Sunstone, everyone in Harleen is very pretty and idealized to the point of distraction. That being said, I personally find his writing to be dull and very surface level. The running internal dialogue of Harleen is pretty basic insight into the character. It's supposed to be intimate and revealing, but it's just long and overwritten, with nothing that indicates a depth worth exploration. I know, there's plenty of people who enjoy and identify with his melodramatic young adult meanderings. I get it, but I don't care for it personally. In some ways, this is an origin story for a new iteration of Harley Quinn. At least, that's where it lands in the end. It begins with Harley, a criminal profiler, attempting to help the Gotham police investigate a series of unsolved crimes. It's revealed early the criminal is the Joker, who takes an interest in the woman attempting to bring him to justice. The artwork is solid. The scenes that happen in the current timeline are in grey tones, while anything that happens in the past is in colour. Originally, these past scenes appear to be actual photographs that have been digitally tweaked to have a comic book appearance. This technique is ditched after a few issues, probably because it was too time consuming to do the photo shoots. It was an interesting experiment while it lasted. One severe criticism is the story uses the tired, modern trope of a serial criminal as a romanticized psychopath whose elaborate crimes reveal some oblique artistic message. The cipher that unlocks that message is the criminal's pathology. It's very much in line with other works such as the novels of James Patterson or more recently the TV series Hannibal. It may be a concept that's character appropriate, but that doesn't make it less worn out. The scene where the Joker plans his own arrest and then is released on the word of Harley does break the story pretty thoroughly. It doesn't ever recover from this highly dubious act. In fact, it gets even more ridiculous after that which is highly unfortunate because, for six issues, it's reasonably well done. But, wow, the final two issues just eviscerate everything that happens before it. 
In fact, the final issue is so contrived and laden with bad devices that it feels insulting to a degree. To be fair, it's no worse than any other generic, serial criminal fiction in modern times. Still, it's very disappointing how quickly it plunges from being solid to being absolutely mediocre. Unfortunately, this story has a pretty tired premise. A psychiatrist assigned to the Joker decides to cure him and winds up going crazy instead. The end. Not a terrible comic, but not exactly original or all that interesting. You get Andrea Sorrentino artwork, so that's a plus. But Jeff Lemire's script is very uninspired. At this point, looking at all the black label titles so far, it seems these Joker-related titles have story ideas that were probably generated by editorial and then assigned to interested writers. Because, quite honestly, these ideas all seem rather generic and tread some well-known territory in other media. Swapping in Bat characters doesn't revive a premise that's been beaten to death by others. This is a straightforward, modern fantasy story and the only new, original property published by Black Label during its first year. It's steeped in mythos and world-building, with a story focused on stopping an ancient, evil god. While there's nothing wrong with the execution, it's just not a story that appealed to me whatsoever. Hard fantasy fans might enjoy this title quite a lot, but it didn't do anything for me and I bailed after the third issue. I can't say it's bad though, it's just a style of story that isn't for me and there's only so much I can endure for the sake of a review. The Question finds himself trying to defeat the literal personification of evil in Hub City. The summary may be short, but it's sweet. I have no problem suggesting this to fans of the 80s Question series. Overall, this is a tribute to the late Denny O'Neill's era of The Question. So much so that the original art team of Dennis Cowan and Bill Sienkiewicz provide the artwork. The story looks like it could have easily taken place in the early days of the 80s series. However, Google is a thing and that didn't exist until well after the series ended. So the time period is modern, but it looks and feels like the late 80s. Critically speaking, the time traveling drug trip was a bit unnecessary and seemed to pad the series into four issues when three would have done just fine. Also, a drug trip to receive illumination, so to speak, is a pretty tired trope. The characters of Myra and Wesley Furman are changed to be brother and sister instead of husband and wife, which was a change I didn't quite get. I'm not sure if Lemire misremembered their relationship or whether there was a reason he made them siblings. If there was a reason, I may have missed it. It's not a change that ruins the story, it's just one that made my continuity senses ping. Otherwise, the series lands exactly where it needs to in the final issue. It's a note-perfect ending. And if I may say, I think Lemire channeled Denny O'Neill in those final pages. It delivers a message without being blunt about what it's communicating. It might not be a very hopeful message, but it is very appropriate. Frank Miller returns for another installment in the Dark Knight franchise. Yep, he sure does. The best thing about this is the artwork by Raphael Grandpa. It looks like a perfect blend of Frank Miller's 2001 Dark Knight style and Frank Whiteley's overall style. It's actually ideal for the material and it made the story much more readable. I only gave it a surface level read, but it seems to be a commentary about youth movements trying to reclaim the power the older generation assumes. It could be Miller's observation about the Occupy movement and the 2016 presidential election in America. It's definitely symbolic to a degree but I couldn't find myself caring enough to try and decode the political message. Wonder Woman wakes up in the distant future to a post-apocalyptic world. All of her hero friends are dead and gone, or they left the planet. What remains of the human race fights daily for survival against brutal, inhuman monsters. Diana pledges to save a group of humans by relocating them to Themyscira, her home island but Themyscira is also a destroyed wasteland. It's here she discovers what happened to bring about this dead planet. Going in, I had low expectations for the series. However, I was pleasantly surprised at the twists and turns and the ultimate explanation for the apocalypse. Everything is neat and tidy and very organic. A few details, such as her bracelets helping to contain her power and Batman's cynical faith that Diana will eventually achieve redemption were really nice touches. In fact, the whole series is very well done. 
is a good examination of Wonder Woman's strengths and flaws. And when her flaws are exploited, or she's in a moment of weakness, her strengths become terrifying. So, that's every title published by Black Label in 2019. Let's pause here and rate everything. The bottom two spots are going to go to Frank Miller. In the top 10 spot, I'm going to have to put Superman Year One. And the number 9 spot has The Dark Knight Returns, The Golden Child. While Frank Miller deserves much respect for the work he's done, I'm not sure what happened to him over the last 20 years. I can't say he doesn't put a lot of thought into the plot or the themes he's looking to explore, but there's just something incoherent in the material. It's almost like he's giving the audience what they want, but he's doing it out of utter contempt. It's like there's a consistent through line of anger and bitterness in the material. It makes for a difficult reading experience. Golden Child is above year one because it's only one issue and because the artwork is pretty amazing. At number eight is Criminal Sanity. This would have placed higher if the ending wasn't so bad it hurt my brain. It hurt my brain a lot. And I'm critically punishing it for starting off strong and then becoming the biggest disappointment at the end. The only reason it's not at the very bottom is because I'm trying to be somewhat fair. The Last God takes seventh place. It probably should be higher on the list because it's not a terrible book, but it just didn't appeal to me at all. So despite the aforementioned fairness, that's the highest rating I can give it. For the next two spots, it was a toss-up between Killer Smile and Harleen. I believe Harleen was an earnest attempt by the creator, even though it was mostly surface level. Killer Smile was just a tired premise done competently. That doesn't make it good, that just makes it less bad. Admittedly, the question is a bit of a nostalgia choice, and it might have been higher on the list if the top three weren't all solid pieces of work. Instead, it winds up at number four. Batman Damned takes number three. The writing is good and the artwork is excellent, but Dead Earth and Last Night on Earth are just a bit better in terms of story appeal. I must have a thing for apocalyptic futures. When it comes to deciding number two and number one, it was a difficult choice between Dead Earth and Last Night. Both are pretty equal in terms of quality and entertainment value, but I had to give the top spot to Last Night. Admittedly, I was more impressed with Dead Earth, but I enjoyed Last Night a little more. Overall, the top three are good reads. The Question, Harleen, and Last God are kind of niche material that might only appeal to specific fans. The rest are not worth it. Sure, they have good qualities. For example, the artwork is great in all of them. But the writing is different levels of inconsistent. So that was Black Label's first year. As an imprint, it still seems to be finding its identity. Looking forward into 2020 and beyond, it appears to evolve into a slightly mature, self-contained timeline type of stories. So far, adult language and themes with some graphic violence are permissible, but nudity or explicitly sexual content is non-existent. If it occurs, it all happens off-panel. In other words, Black Label publishes rather mainstream stories that just don't fit within DC continuity, and it's heavily based on Batman-related characters. Once again, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, leave a comment, and subscribe if you're new. All your feedback, good, bad, or indifferent, influences what I do next. So always feel free to leave a suggestion in the comments section below. As always, thanks to all the fine members who directly support this channel. Behind the scenes, these are tough times. After one video was age-restricted, views have plummeted to less than a third of what they had been previously. So things are looking pretty dire. Any support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Until next time. If there is a next time. <laughs>